Hello, I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. I'm joined by Brian Green, Professor of Physics and Mathematics at Columbia University. Hey, Brian, it's great to see you today. Great to see you. I've really been enjoying plowing through this amazing work uh, until the end of time. Uh, what, what number book is this for you? Uh, this is the fourth book for adults. I have one for kids in the middle of that. Well, well, it's incredible. I've loved watching the arc of your career as a scientist and a public intellectual um, and, a, and a creator. And it's so great for us to have you here today for the Ideas Festival to be able to talk a little bit about how you started, um, some of the formative ideas you developed uh, as you were a student, and then let's get to the book. So first of all, um, I know you, you uh, are a New Yorker. How did you first get interested in science? Well, it's actually one very specific day. I went to the planetarium. I grew up across the street from the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And one day I was heading back to school after a school trip to the planetarium. And I felt so tiny. We were like thinking about stars and galaxies and other worlds. And it just made me feel so tiny. So I started to ask the questions that everybody asks. But I asked them in a sort of really intense way, like, why am I here? What is the point of it all? And it just struck me walking back to school that if there was an answer, everybody would know it by now. But since no one ever told me the answer, it was clear that there wasn't a universal answer. And therefore, rather than trying to answer that question, I said, what if I shifted a little bit, not to why am I here, but how am I here? How is there an Earth? How is there a universe? How are there galaxies? And that really is what propelled me to physics. You and I have been friends for years, and I've heard some of the stories about your education. Um, and one thing I've always been struck with is that you, you had very good science education, math education, when you were coming up in New York City. And say a word about that. Well, I went to public schools. I went to PS87 and IS44, but if you have great teachers, right, you don't have to be at some fancy private school. And so I had these wonderful teachers who realized that I was able to do math pretty well, and they allowed me to go fast at my own pace. And when I exhausted what the school could provide, my teacher gave me a little letter. He said, go to Columbia University with this letter. And I did with my sister. We knocked on doors, gave the letter. Most people read it and gave it back. I didn't even know what the letter said. But one guy I gave it to and he read it and he said, sure, I'll teach you, you know, and I, for free. And then I met with him three days a week over the summer and uh, during the year on Saturdays. And I, 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 I took off into all these areas of mathematics that I never would have encountered if it wasn't for this guy, Neil Bellinson, who really opened the world of math to me as a young kid. So then uh, you went to college at Harvard. And uh, what was the quality of the education that you received there? Not bad, you know. Well, you know, of course, Harvard has the greatest mathematicians and the greatest scientists in the world. They're not always the greatest teachers. So I'm not saying that every class that I took was really something where I would think of it as the, the model of pedagogy. But to hear from the very people that are pushing the boundary of understanding, there's something deeply exciting about that. So you really felt you were in the midst of science in the making, and that just gets you excited. And that's, that's a big part of the process itself. You've always had so many diverse interests in culture, the arts, politics, um, society. And um, is that how you were when you were in high school and in college, or did that come later? No, definitely later. You know, I was pretty single-minded when I was younger. It was just math. Yeah, It's the only thing that I really cared about. And in fact, I hated reading when I was a kid. And that sort of spilled over all the way to college. I mean, in college, when, when I would go to the bookstore to get a textbook for, say, my physics class, I'd crack it open. If there are a lot of words, my heart sank. If there are a lot of equations, I was like, yes, yes, this will work. You know, and it was really, it was really later on. It was really at Oxford where you and I, of course, both met that that shifted for me because when I graduated college, I went through a period of deep regret. I felt like I got a technical training in math and physics. And I was like, I had this opportunity to explore the world of ideas. And all I did was push forward in one direction. I'd been on that trajectory for 20 years. And so when I got to Oxford, I sort of felt like here's a chance. 
one of our conversations that one of the things you hope to do was to popularize science, make it accessible and exciting to more people. And then Brian and I joined a writing group where we were each sharing with some other students things we were working on. And you came into that group. You weren't you weren't giving us um, mini lectures. You were giving us plays, as I remember. Um, so say a little bit about that opportunity to start to think of yourself as a writer. Yeah, that was a great and unexpected, really gift to to learn about that group. And I think I probably learned about it from you. And and you know to be able to write in a way that wasn't trying to communicate rigorous ideas of science, but rather trying to communicate something of experience and the human condition and how we react to things and try to put that together into a narrative or a story or a play, for me, was kind of a turning point in my recognition of what you could do with words and language. I remember you're being interested in or struck by some of the absurdities of life. And it, we sometimes talked about literature, Milan Kundera maybe, that, that pointed to that. Um, and is that something that somehow relates to your work as a as a theorist yeah deeply so you know now when i'm say solving schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics although there's some absurdity to that too but that's a whole different discussion but you know when i was when i was young i had an unexpected introduction to camus my dad had a copy of the myth of sisyphus and it was all about the absurd. It was all about you know, the deep questions of, is life worth living when you recognize yeah. that there doesn't seem to be some overarching purpose to things. So I feel like my, my life's work has been on one trajectory, trying to understand the physical universe as deeply as possible, but the other trajectory is to recognize that the more we understand, the more it seems clear that there is no overarching purpose. So the deeper we go into physics, to me, makes it seem all the more absurd in the sense of Camus. But of course, Camus found a way to find meaning even in an absurd universe. And, and yeah. in a sense, that's really, in a sense, that's what my new book is really about in some sense, the journey that gets you to that. But for me, it's a cosmological journey that gets me to that point, whereas, you know, the great existentialist philosophers got there from a different, different trajectory. How did the, the book itself, um, which is this exploration of time and meaning, physics, how did it even come together for you to do this book? Well, you know, I'd written a few books before, as you noted, and they were all really about bringing cutting-edge science to a general audience. String theory, space-time, relativity, quantum mechanics, all that stuff. But every time I was writing one of those books, it felt to me there was a whole other story waiting to be told, which is how do these insights not just give us a deeper sense of how the world works, but how do they affect our sense of who we are and how we fit in to the larger picture? And I don't know, when I was younger, it just didn't seem that I had the standing or it didn't seem the time was right to take on those big philosophical issues. And, and now as the years passed, I felt like I was really ready to do that. And so I just launched in and, and this was the result. So one of the things that you write about, a critical important thing, is that trying to take a cosmic timeline. Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, we all have a sense of the timescales of the everyday, the timescales of our lives. But what I wanted the reader to get a deep sense of is how does that timescale fit in to the cosmological unfolding from the Big Bang to the closest that science can take us to what might be called the end. And when you follow that grand sweep, which is enormous time scales, I take you in this book from time zero, if you will, out to 10 to the 100 years from now. We're at like 10 to the 10 years now. And that exponent, that's an exponential difference. And when you can see your life within this cosmological timeline, this cosmological landscape, to me, it gives you a radically different perspective and one that I think can have an impact in how you think about yourself and think about your life. Um, what about the meaning part? With that cosmological time frame, the, the cosmic sense of the enormity of history, but also that the, the, the time can end, uh, time will end, I guess, scientifically speaking. Um, how then do you derive meaning out of that? Well, that's really in some sense what the book is about, I mean, when you learn that stars disintegrate and planets disintegrate and life 
itself disintegrates. And even, as I argue in the book, consciousness has a finite duration on the cosmological timeline. It can leave you with a sense of, what's the point of it all? It all goes away. And if your sense of meaning is derived from legacy and from looking to the future, then yeah, that's going to crumble in time. And the argument that I make in the book is actually a very familiar one. It's that we need to focus on the here and now, something we've heard of from philosophers and mindfulness teachers and sages across the ages. So it's nothing novel from that perspective. But the way I take you there from this cosmological perspective and this recognition that it all disintegrates, to me, adds a heft and a weight to the arguments that focus you here. And it also is the journey that I went through. I did have dark periods when I began to better understand what would happen in the far future. And I myself went through a transformation where I recognized that the focus needs to be here as opposed to there because there disintegrates. Some people having that same experience of wonder that you had as a child um, and then deep reflection find themselves sensing the presence of a larger creating other. That how could all this come together? But with some form of design. Yeah. You've been thinking about that question for years, I bet. Uh, how do you answer that today when people bring that to you? Well, first, they may be right. Behind it all, there could be some intelligence that has set it all up and then sat back and let it all unfold. It's very difficult to prove that that perspective is wrong. But I don't see any evidence for it, and I'm drawn when I'm talking about the objective qualities of the external world to things that do have evidence, experiment, observation behind them. However, unlike many of my colleagues, which kind of I find tragic and heartbreaking, who go out into the world and say we want to rid the world of religion. Religion is something from the infancy of the species. It's time to outgrow it. That's not my perspective at all, because the objective world, that's important to understand. I've dedicated my life to doing so. But the subjective world of inner experience, of, of conscious self-reflection is just as important. And for many people, not all, but for many people, a theological perspective, a religious perspective, let me call it a spiritual perspective, is something that can illuminate your own place and your own reactions and your own sense of self. And that journey is just as important as the journey to understand the objective world. So I think there is a deep and important place so long as you recognize that you can't use religion to calculate the electron's magnetic moment to 10 decimal places. That's the purview of quantum field theory. But once you realize that there are different kinds of questions in different journeys, there is a place for both. So it's, and it's an integration of your ability to think in terms of phil uh, philosophical and, and um, uh, physical concepts with other dimensions of life. It's not one or the other. Exactly. How does it inform, I, I, I'm not, would you call it a, a materialist perspective or what is it that you define as this perspective that takes the cosmic timeline? Well, it is a materialist perspective or a physicalist perspective. It's the recognition that, well, there's no proof of this, but all the available evidence suggests that it's just stuff out there governed by physical law. Yeah. We are, in this language, nothing but bags of particles governed by the laws of physics. Yeah. And sometimes when I say that, people feel like I'm denigrating what it means to be human, but actually I feel like I'm aggrandizing it because... Once you recognize that all you are is a bag of particles governed by physical law, and when you realize that that bag of particles can, can do things like write the Ninth Symphony, or build the pyramids, or paint the Mona Lisa, or, or write King Lear, you say to yourself, wow, look at what particles governed by physical law can accomplish. How spectacular is that? So to me, it really is adding a certain kind of wonder to what we can do as opposed to taking it away. How does this help you ground a sense of, of your personal morality or personal ethics? It's an interesting question and a deep one because I, for instance, do not believe in free will. I believe that the arguments that we're touching upon here 
establish that every action we take is the product of physical law acting on the constituents that make us up. And some people say, well, if you don't have free will, then morality is gone, moral responsibility is gone. And I do not think that is true at all. I think that we are responsible for what our particles do, period, end of story. It's our particles. The question is, should we be punished? And here's where the issue, I think, shifts a little bit, because if punishment is for retribution, I don't see any role for it. If punishment is for education, either for the individual or those who are watching the punishment being doled out, you can learn, even if you don't have free will. My Roomba, going around the house, learns where my furniture is, even though it doesn't have free will. And so if punishment is in that guise, a consequentialist perspective, punishment is to shape future behaviors, then I think that is a absolutely justifiable way to dole out punishments. And do you mean this shaping as a form of conditioning? In some sense, if you want to use that language, but in the end of the day, our behaviors are a product of our genetic makeup, our physical makeup, and that is affected by the stimulus that we receive and the responses that we yield across our lives. And so, yeah, if I see something in the world, some action undertaken, and I see that agent being punished for that action, my particles can rearrange in a manner that says, hey, I don't want that to happen to me. I love this. I love this conversation. It throws me back to standing outside of potato trucks on High we Street met there every in night Aspen almost while. every night. But I don't buy it because you made the choice to write four books. And no, your particles are the only particles on the planet Earth that could have written those books. Don't tell me they were pre-written and you just happened to grab them. So how do you account for that? Well, so, so it's a good point. And, and you're right. The individual has a particular arrangement that is iconic, that is special, and therefore your actions reflect your particle arrangement. So I agree that when Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony, it was Beethoven's particles that had the capacity to do that. But did they freely do that? No. Did I freely write my books? I do not, in the conventional sense, that I can claim that the actions originated fully and totally within me, that I somehow transcended the forces in the world around me and was able to do something that was not the product of those physical laws acting on my particles. No. Okay. But still, if, if we don't have unlimited freedom, doesn't it mean that we have some freedom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I would say the answer to that is yes, but the kind of freedom you may not find satisfying, which is this. I have a greater range of behavioral responses available to me than does a rock. The rock just sits there regardless of what you do to the rock because it doesn't have the internal organization to respond in a rich spectrum of behaviors. So I have this rich spectrum of behaviors. I don't choose them. But yet, if the stimuli from the environment are slightly different, my responses will be different. And there are a range of responses that I can give. One such response is writing a book. And a rock doesn't do that. So it's not freedom from physical law. It's freedom from the constrained behavior that governs the inanimate world. And I am thankful for that behavior. But look, if I write a good sentence or solve an equation, I don't take credit from it in the way that we usually think about it. I did it. I say to myself, hey, particles, nice job. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really pleased that the forces came together to yield that outcome. And I'm not joking here. I, yeah, I this is you. how I really think about how we fit into the world. Well, let me just say this. My particles love your particles. <laughs> you are an yeah. awesome person, an incredible teacher, a creator, uh, and a great friend. And it's been just a pleasure to host you today. Well, thank you. I feel the same way. So this is a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.